Okay. Okay. Today we are very happy to have Clifford Johnson, who will be speaking about non perturbative studies of JT gravity and supergravity using minimal strings. Well, thank you. And it's a uh, thanks for the invitation to speak. And it's a, it's a pleasure to see at least the uh, boxes with names uh, with so many uh, uh, familiar old friends. Um, uh, since we're uh, uh, all away from chalkboards um, uh, quite a lot these days, I, I thought I would uh, 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 do my uh, talk a chalkboard style. So hopefully that works. And so indeed, I'm going to try and tell you about, uh, with a particular focus on, on, on non-perturbative results, uh, some of the things you can do with JT gravity and JT supergravity models. And the key lesson is that I think there's a lot to be learned from the old minimal string technology. And there's a sense, which I'll make very precise, uh, in which you can construct uh, gravity and supergravity, JT gravity and supergravity from minimal strings in a particular way. You can extract uh, actual uh, results. It's not just a formal exercise. And uh, um, I, I think there's a lot to be done in particular, I think uh, things like deformations of these models and things like that will will simply correspond to changing the recipe of how you put the minimal strings together. So I'll do some uh, very brief motivations with apologies for going probably quite quickly over some of the uh, recent JT work, but I think uh, probably, especially at this audience, uh, that's probably okay. And um, so I'll do a rapid review of the JT gravity equals matrix model um, uh, language. Uh, in the way that Saad, Schenker, and Stanford do it, and also Stanford and Witten. But then I'll rapidly uh, move on to talk about an alternative approach, which perturbatively is equivalent, but gives you uh, much more direct access, in my view, uh, um, to non-perturbative information. Although I have a suspicion that there may be a way of going back to the other methods and uh, uh, maybe uh, finding non-perturbative definitions there too. Perhaps I'll say a little bit what I mean later. And I'll explicitly get, give you some results, uh, including some new results, um, and uh, then there'll be a summary. So the three papers in which uh, these ideas uh, and techniques are developed are, are listed there. And uh, there's um, probably another, another one to come uh, soon with some, with some of these new results. So by way of motivation, I simply uh, need to show you the various areas of uh, interest uh, in their own right uh, that are exciting, uh, that all intersect, they all connect in some ways through JT gravity. JT gravity has a, play, a role to play either directly by reduction from higher dimensions, or it is a, a laboratory in its own right for studying aspects of uh, say, uh, two-dimensional black hole physics. Um, it's a model of two-dimensional quantum gravity. And there are all sorts of exciting things you can do. There's a low energy duality to uh, systems um, such as SYK. So it's a good diagnostic for uh, aspects of quantum chaos. And as we're gonna talk about a lot today, it's also a wonderful laboratory for understanding uh, the use of uh, and applications of random matrix dynamics. And also it's worth I think the connections between these two corners um, particularly are, are very interesting and fruitful. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I'm gonna do by way of motivation. Let me just remind you a little bit about uh, uh, Jakeith Teitelbaum uh, gravity. Uh, the action can be written uh, like this. I have in mind some, uh, some model which could include not just as we'll see later on when we come to thinking about higher topologies, not just um, orientable, but also unorientable surfaces. So uh, symbolically, I'll represent that by having a little cross cap insertion there in, in addition to handle insertions you might have. Um, the action looks like this. Uh, S0, you can think of as the, um, uh, the, uh, the ground state entropy of, uh, of the black hole this model came reduced from, for example. And uh, then there's um, very importantly uh, a description, a, a, a division between um, having uh, the model in the bulk 
M, M refers to this manifold, and the boundary uh, uh, terms as well. And those are, of course, very important. And I won't have time to go into the full derivation, but as you may know, the boundary, boundary dynamics uh, is, is all important. The, uh, sorry, I think I skipped this slide. Ah, yes, the, um, the uh, equations of motion for phi, because this is linear, the equations of motion for phi are, are particularly simple to express, and they simply tell you that you're on some uh, locally ADS2 background, and uh, uh, as a two-dimensional gravity, that's pretty much all you get for the bulk. For the boundary, there's non-trivial dynamics, the non-trivial dynamics is a nice way of writing it is as follows. I have some ADS2. It's a nearly ADS2 in the sense that the boundary isn't all the way out um, uh, to, um, to the boundary. There's some finite length uh, boundary, which in fact uh, we'll call beta in a moment, which will be the inverse temperature. You can think of this parameterization uh, as a way of organizing things, if you like. And there's some Schwarzschild dynamics on the boundary, um, which, uh, so there's the Schwarzschild action. I've, I, I've put some, some boundary coordinate u, and there's some action that looks like this, where u is a t, uh, prime is a u derivative. So if you parameterize the boundary with some, uh, uh, in the way I just said, and have it some fixed length beta, but otherwise allow it to wiggle, allow this shape to be whatever it wants to be according to the Schwarzschild dynamics. And uh, a lot of this was developed in these papers. Uh, you will get uh, this result in some normalization for the uh, leading, as we'll see, for, the, for this disk uh, geometry, part of the partition function looks like this. The e to the s0 simply comes from the form of the action that I wrote uh, previously, and then there's some nice dependence, which I'm going to talk about in a slightly different way in a moment. And, and here it is. The way I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to focus on a lot is rewriting this in terms of a spectral density via this Laplace transform. And uh, the result, as you probably know, for the spectral density is this nice um, cinch function, cinch root e, with some constants. Henceforth, I'm going to write this factor uh, as 1 over h bar. This h bar is um, going to actually be an h bar in a quantum mechanics problem in a moment. Um, and the full perturbation theory by virtue of what I wrote earlier but did not comment on. The full perturbation theory, going back here, you can see involves developing this on surfaces of arbitrary topology with that fixed boundary. And the topology is counted by this term here. Uh, this Euler density, and indeed there's the minus S naught times chi, and there's the chi. So the leading piece um, had uh, G equals zero, C equals zero, and B equals one, and so that was the uh, that was the factor that we saw a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago. So let me jump back there. So there we are. So that's the whole um, story so far. Um, what we want to do then is uh, go beyond this. But first, let me point out that there's also a supergravity version of this story. And let me refer you to Stanford and Witten for more on that. But the output is, is somewhat similar, uh, a, a slightly different function uh, here, different powers of beta, uh, crucially, but actually very importantly then when you do the uh, transform to the spectral density, you have this cosh root e over root e behavior, which will uh, feature a lot in what I'm going to talk about later. So let's talk about going beyond the disk. Well, first of all, why would we want to do that? So, so far I wrote that and I will use diagrams like this instead of this uh, later on. So this is just to mean 
some almost uh, ADS-2 space-time. So this sort of trumpet shape is meant to invoke the uh, negative curvature. And, uh, and then there's the boundary. But you might imagine also having a uh, higher genus in the way I described earlier, and I'll symbolically represent it as follows. And you might ask, well, why? Well, diagrams of higher topology are important for diagnosing uh, quantum chaos, for example, the, the, the cylinder uh, diagram, and in particular, non-perturbative effects, by which I mean effects, parts, uh, contributions that cannot be written as, as some uh, part of some perturbative series in genus. Those non-perturbative effects are especially important uh, for a lot of reasons. I'll give you in a moment uh, a couple of examples. And it's also just fun to do because it's a toy theory of quantum gravity and we're interested in quantum gravity. So space-time should be changing its geometry and topology in some, in some naive understanding of what quantum gravity should be. So if I plotted that cinch function, for example, it would look something like this. I'm gonna use a little subscript zero to say that leading piece, the disk. What I want to do is go beyond that. I want the full um, row, which is going to be some some function which uh, um, will will have some more structure than just that. Although at large energies, e large compared to h bar, it will eventually merge back with the cinch function. So our expectation would be to look for something like this. But how on earth do you compute that? So that's one of the things I'm going to tell you how to do. Also, uh, you're very interested in quantities like the spectral form factor, which is that uh, an example of a um, function you might compute, which diagnoses the uh, chaotic behavior of the model, and uh, or if you like the dual models. And uh, so you can think of it in terms of being some two-point function of Z, the partition function, which is appropriately analytically continued and then you're studying the large, uh, the, the, the large time behavior and certain important features emerge. Um, there's a lot of literature on this, which I don't have time to uh, go into, but very briefly, what you're, uh, what you're gonna look for, certainly at leading order, the disconnected piece, which is essentially two copies of the partition function, uh, will give you some decay, what's called the slope, and then there's a cylinder type piece which will give you the what's called the ramp uh, the rising part to the ramp at later times uh interestingly enough that's as far as you can go with doing uh, uh, perturbation theory um you need you can you can get higher order corrections to these but you need non-perturbative physics in order to see how this all fits together in order to build the full spectrum form, spectral form factor, which will have the slope turning into some dip, going up some ramp, and then turning over into this place where it saturates. Uh, this whole business here needs non-perturbative physics. So I'm gonna show you how to compute that and I'll give you results at the end. So uh, let's talk about matrix models. And I'm gonna do this in, in two movements. Uh, so the first movement will be just uh, reviewing what uh, happened with uh, what I'll call this, I'll sometimes just say triple S, Sard, Schenker, and Stanford in this paper. And uh, so, so rho should be really thought of as some leading piece, so I should have a little subscript zero on there, some leading piece of the uh, uh, spectral density of some Hermitian matrix model in what's called the double scaling limit. And what I need to do is tell you what the double scaling limit is, and I will. Uh, so the Hermitian matrix model roughly looks something like this. It's some random uh, model of random uh, matrix, which is um, M, it's N by N, and I have some model that looks like this. I'm putting hats and tildes on things to distinguish it from the quantities that we'll be really interested in at the end, which won't have hats and tildes on. So it's some model with some potential like this. If you like, it's a zero-dimensional um, uh, uh, quantum field theory, and uh, we learned from we learned from uh, from Tooth, for example, that actually an expansion of the Feynman diagrams that you would write down uh, actually are very good at capturing two-dimensional topology. So I can write down Feynman diagrams 
uh, look at, at large n, the leading large n gives me diagrams I can draw on uh, on the uh, on the on the sphere, and uh, the one over n squared correction to that gives me things I can draw on the torus and so on and so forth. The double scaling limit is something which, uh, well, it's due to uh, Breza, Kazakov, ah, yikes, Breza and Kazakov, and uh, accidentally jumped forward a slide, forgive me. Uh, Breza and Kazakov, Douglas Schenker, and uh, Gross and McDowell in 89, going into 1990. What you do as you take the large n limit is you also tune, so there's a coupling in the potential here. You could do this for any old potential, but what's really interesting is to tune the, the potential to a place where there's a particular critical point. That critical point essentially has the, the surfaces that you're tessellating in this way, and I can think of this as a tessellation of surfaces by just drawing, should have done that, should have drawn a little diagram, just drawing the sort of dual to these, um, uh, to this, um, to this, uh, actually I do have a diagram later on, to this Feynman diagram, and you'll, in this case, you'll see you're building the surfaces out of squares. And, um, those surfaces actually you want to dom the large surfaces you want to dominate as you take the large end limit you want large surfaces to dominate you want to scale things in such a way if you kept those surfaces finite all of the um sort of small non-universal surfaces actually go away in the limit uh leaving you with these nice large smooth surfaces and uh so that's what the double scaling limit is and i'm going to go into much more detail about how that works um shortly but as a first pass, that's all you need to know what that's doing for you. Uh, so what you do uh, from the point of view of solving this as a, as a matrix model is you diagonalize M with a unitary of this, of this sort uh, into, uh, I'm gonna call the, uh, the energy eigenvalues E with a, with, a, with a tilde over them. And uh, these, this problem, uh, which is called the Dyson gas, is essentially a one-dimensional problem. I have some E's lying along the line, and there's two interesting competing factors here. There's the original potential you put in, which I've drawn perhaps as this, uh, this, um, this blue line here, but then the Vandermond determinant that came, the Jacobian from changing variables from M to lambda, the Vandermond determinant, which uh, you can think of as a repulsive term between the individual eigenvalues. You can see that, um, uh, for example, if you, ex if you exponentiate this and put it into potential, it looks like a logarithmic repulsion. That's repelling the eigenvalues. So you end up forming some sort of droplet uh, as, as, your, as your saddle point solution of this problem. The double scaling limit actually focuses on the endpoint of this, uh, of this uh, droplet. And um, it's sort of that business of creaming off the right surfaces that give you this smooth description of the random surfaces corresponds to drilling down just to this endpoint. It doesn't matter whether it's this one or this one, but we'll pick this one. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Let me just give you an example. The simplest case, the Gaussian case, um, I can uh, write the eigenvalue density as something like this. It's uh, the famous Wigner semicircle law, um, which looks like that. If I drill down to the endpoint, and I've shifted things, written this in a slightly different way, I've shifted the thing so that the origin is at uh, uh, where the endpoint is. Then if I change variables and I expand around small e tilde, the leading piece being e with no hat on it, no tilde on it, then I get the square root behavior. And so that uh, I'm going to label this k equals one because there's a much larger class of models, um, what in the old days were called the multicritical models, where you can, instead of just the Gaussian case, you can write down some larger polynomial potential. And in each case, there's some critical values of the couplings for those that give you some analogous to this e to the k minus a half type behavior. So k equals one is uh, the simplest one, but I have these k 
an, in an infinite family of uh, these models which look like this. Once the dust settled and all of this was uh, understood a little bit more using techniques from string theory and conformal field theory, et cetera, these were actually identified as the conformal minimal models coupled to two dimensional gravity, what we now call minimal strings. Um, and, and that was, uh, so this is still, we're, we're still back in the, uh, in the early 90s here. And uh, so th this, in th this notation, when I refer to the conformal field theory, this is the old minimal model um, notation, and it's the two, uh, 2k minus one. Uh, conformal minimal model. The kind of matrix model we're after is, 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 is not quite of this kind, the triple S matrix model for JT, um, uh, and nor are the, uh, so SW here will be uh, Stanford Witten, uh, who generalized um, the uh, triple S prescription to define uh, many more types of JT gravity using different matrix ensembles, random matrix ensembles. Uh, these are not really um, uh, quite, you know, these aren't any of these minimal models per se, but they share key features. I'm gonna show you some of those key features, which suggests how you might build them out of these minimal models. If I take the cinch function and simply expand it, for example, and look uh, at the terms in the expansion, you'll see various powers, you'll see a root E, uh, and, and, and higher powers like that, you'll, he, you'll see this kind of behavior, which is characteristic of the minimal uh, string models. Of course, the JT gravity contains all of them in some way, in some particular combination. And so looking ahead, this is what we're going to shoot for. We're gonna see, is there a way, is there a meaningful way in which I can combine the models so that they all contribute uh, their, their, uh, their characteristic uh, power of E in this combination? Uh, that will rebuild this function. And that'll get us, that we'll get that right on the disk. Um, but then, uh, because I have ways of defining the minimal models beyond just perturbation theory, uh, all of that uh, technology will then help you define JT uh, beyond just perturbation theory as well. So that's the roadmap. You can do a similar, uh, you can do a similar expansion for uh, supergravity as well. The difference is you will still have these, uh, these uh, fractional half powers of E, but you'll also have a one over root E type behavior as well. So the uh, function looks like this for JT and for a JT supergravity model, you have this kind of behavior. There's this coming from here, there's this uh, uh, one over root E divergence. That'll be very interesting. Notice that the minimal models I've described so far do not have that kind of behavior. So what do we want? Well, going back to JT, what we want is um, not just the leading order piece, not just, yeah, done it again, not just, uh, not just row zero, but we want higher order as well. I have a picture like that. Uh, in this case, I haven't cluttered it by drawing in possibly diagrams with, uh, the, which are non-orientable for other types of JT, but you get the idea. So there'll be some power, uh, uh, some power counting in terms of powers of H, and then the beyond refers to non-perturbative physics that we also want to capture. So how to compute? So this was nicely, this was one of the key outputs of, uh, of triple S and also SW. Um, uh, which is that you can write down the matrix model uh, in, 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 in general terms and derive a family of recursion relations that tell you how to get the uh, row at some, uh, some genus G from row at some lower genus. So that essentially all you need is that uh, row zero to start with to seed those recursion relations. Uh, those recursion relations are defined um, uh, in, ge in general for the matrix model, but then you can follow your nose and do double scaling on the recursion relations themselves to uh, define the, uh, the, the physics you want of the smooth surfaces. What you need to do then is uh, you need row zero and essentially you're done. That's a nice prescription. You, of course, need to check some highly non-trivial things need to work out. And that's, of course, uh, why those papers are so exciting. You need to check 
that in each case, all those recursion relations, all of those uh, um, uh, terms that you get on the matrix model side are actually reproducing the physics that uh, should be there for the JT gravity computations um, uh, order by order in genus. And uh, for that, you need some powerful mathematical techniques uh, derived, for example, by uh, Merzakhani and uh, adapted to matrix model language by Enyard and Laurentin. And uh, that's the sort of technology they use. So I'm not using any of that today, but I just needed to remind you that that's what that does. And it's highly non-trivial and very exciting. So what I'm here to tell you is that there's another way of doing this, but of course, led by those papers. Um, and, and this other way will enable the and beyond part the uh, not just reproducing those results or results that are equivalent to that, but going beyond finding ways of getting the non-perturbative physics. So this means I have to go a little bit deeper into the matrix model technology. So I'm gonna tell you uh, a couple of things and it's gonna seem magical at first, right? Um, uh, and this is stuff that everyone knew back in the 90s, but uh, a lot of people have not really been following that technology. Rho turns out to be um, the spectral density of an associated one-dimensional system, at least for some class of matrix models. There's some Hamiltonian, uh, uh, there's, some, uh, there's some spatial variable X and there's some potential U of X. This is not the matrix model potential. Uh, uh, that's uh, pot potentially confusing, but it, it isn't. Um, and it arises from the matrix model after double scaling limit, and it satisfies some nonlinear ODE, some nonlinear um, ordinary differential equation, which in the old days was called the string equation. And so all you have to do is solve the spectral problem of this Hamiltonian, construct this spectral density, and I'll motivate this form uh, shortly uh, for a suitable normalization of the psi. And, uh, and you're done. That row will be the row uh, that we're looking for. And so that seems a little magical. So I need to explain uh, where do these things come from? So let's go back to the double scaled matrix model. Where does this U come from? Where's the X variable come from? Things like that. So I go back to the matrix model um, that I wrote down before, for example. And uh, so you go back now to the 70s, um, Bresin et al, Bessis et al, and remind yourself that you can actually write the matrix model in a different way. You can write it in terms of uh, a family of n orthogonal matrix mo <laughs> orthogonal polynomials, which start out as uh, the nth one, little nth one starts out as e to the n. And uh, they're orthogonal in this sense with respect to the measure of the matrix model of interest, uh, the potential that you put in, v. And this is the orthogonality with some normalization here, h. So uh, uh, interesting, so you can find these, um, uh, for example, in the case of the ARI model, it's just the Hermite polynomials, but it's, it's much more general uh, for arbitrary E. And in fact, it's natural to work in terms of these P's in ways that won't have a huge amount of detail, uh, time to go into a huge amount of detail, but I can hopefully give you the, the salient uh, 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 parts. So uh, I, I can write this as, uh, as, as, as this product, uh, this bra and ket notation like this, where I've normalized uh, the p's by root h uh, and called them n like that. So, so uh, insertions of things into this integral, which will amount to, uh, which you'll want to do if you're trying to look, uh, insert things into this integral, will amount to sandwiching them in this way, uh, in this language. There's uh, a relationship between, uh, if I multiply Pn by, by E, uh, that's Pn plus one, according to what I wrote here, plus other Ps. And in the simplest case, it's just this nice simple function An, which, uh, sorry, function, it's a, it's a bunch of numbers, An, um, which, uh, uh, which label, uh, uh, which tell you how much of Pn minus one uh, is there. Other matrix models, you might have additional terms. Um, it turns out that then the partition function, the, the full matrix model itself can be written in terms, you can just decompose it entirely in terms of A or the H's. And so the problem of solving the model becomes the problem of writing down the A's or the H's. So there are many details I'm going to have to skip here, but 
the large n limit then goes along reasonably familiar lines, but let me let me do it a little bit more carefully. Uh, let me define a, a variable capital X, little n over n. So so the range of that formally is from zero to to uh, to to one, um, and uh, and then I'll define epsilon equals one over n, which I'll I'll need shortly. Then uh, in the large n limit, these quantities, the a n, will become some sort of function of x, written thus, a, a of x. And it turns out that the kind of uh, the spectral density then at large n, which is really the leading piece, and again, I should have a subscript zero on there, uh, can be uh, written in terms of this kind of integral, an integral that looks like this. So this is the range of, uh, of, of capital X. And there's something uh, that looks like this. There's some A of X, there's the energies. And uh, depending upon the model, it'll end up looking like the square root that we had before. So that is, uh, and then some polynomial in E. Now, interestingly, uh, okay, well, I'm going too fast here. The, the Wigner case, the Gaussian case, this, this, this would actually just be a constant, and this would be the square root, the semicircle behavior we had before. So this is the generalization. The endpoints are at x equals one in this language, and the double scaling limit then, and, and so it looks something like this, uh, this curve here. And uh, so if you like that, multiplying by that f um, makes us go away from being a semicircle to some interesting other shape. The double scaling limit then is the zooming in, but now you can see that uh, I, I can do that a little bit more carefully now. So what I do, let me introduce a parameter delta that I will send to zero uh, at, 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 at the end of uh, what I'm about to do. Uh, that will correspond to going to large n, but I'm gonna do that carefully. I'm gonna go to large n and I'm gonna zoom in on the endpoint very carefully. I'm gonna have scaled quantities. So one is the value that we're, gonna, that we're interested in at the x point. I'm gonna be away from one by a little bit. Uh, x, um, uh, it turns out minus a parameter mu, I'll tell you what that is in a moment, times some power of delta. Uh, epsilon is some power of delta, that was one over n, if you remember, that's gonna be our h bar. And a, the function a will be its value at the end point. Uh, but again, I scale away from it a little bit with some power of delta. And you can just throw that all into the matrix model and it'll tell you if you're gonna get anything finite and uh, physical, it'll tell you what those different powers are. They just follow from dimensional analysis. Uh, mu essentially is a, uh, is a remnant of what happens when I scale the critical coupling away from its, uh, its value. So there's G is G critical, um, uh, but slightly away from it and that defines mu, and that ends up being in X as well, it turns out. So this is, as I said, um, uh, due to uh, uh, these, uh, these folks. So what's delta? You can think of delta simply as uh, the typical size of one of these things that's making your tessellation. The green of the Feynman di diagrams I drew earlier, I have in mind here, for example, an M cubed potential. So this is triangles, and the size of the triangle goes to zero, because I'm going to G critical, I'm getting those nice, large, smooth surfaces that we discussed previously. Okay, so that's the double scaling limit done a little bit more carefully. So what you can see is that this function U arises the scaling piece of A and the coordinate X uh, arises the scaling piece of, uh, of, uh, of, this, of this capital X here. That's the origin of those things. If I do that now in this language, uh, um, this way of writing the spectral density for the full unscaled model, I'm really plugging that into this upper limit here and doing that. And uh, after a bit of algebra, up to some numbers that I'll fix in a moment, uh, you'll get this as the result for the uh, disk, uh, in our language, what we'd call the disk spectral density. So that is the business of as we had before, zooming in on the endpoint, but now done more carefully. So that's where the uh, function u comes from. Um, another picture of this, if, if you like to think, and there's a really nice intuition to be had by thinking in terms of u. Another picture of this is as follows. u uh, 
Uh, so there's some full U that we'll talk about in a moment. What we're looking at right now in the large N leading large N limit uh, is just the, uh, the leading classical piece that I call U zero. And so rho uh, that we're interested in is rho zero here. The coefficient turns out to be one over two pi h bar in the normalization that I'm using. And then I have this integral over x of the square root of e minus u zero. And uh, I've color coded the different pieces in this diagram. So, so um, I'm at some, I'm computing at some energy e. I have some potential. I've drawn a piece of it here. Um, I've stopped at x equals zero because that's the endpoint of the eigenvalue density in the other picture. I'm integrating from minus infinity up to here. For now, I'm setting mu equals zero, and I'll tell you what it means more generally in a moment. I'm integrating up to here. Really, I should integrate from uh, the place where um, the square root vanishes, and I do that integral. But sometimes people just put a minus infinity here, and it's understood that I just take the real part. And so then I compute this difference and stick it in there and do the integral. So that's what that means. And uh, in doing this, this then builds in the other space, it builds rho of E for you. So when I look at pictures of potentials later on, and this is the, uh, another advantage of this, just looking at how it's behaving uh, in, in some of these interesting regions, knowing how the spectral density comes from the, an integral like this or more general version in a moment, uh, will give me a lot of intuition uh, for how the matrix model is doing what it does. So um, I'll write this as follows. Um, so this is what I wrote before, where I've just sort of stuck a minus infinity on here, but if you like, just sort of cut it off where this uh, goes to zero. And uh, you'll see the minus infinity makes sense in the full story in a moment. And there's a one, and then I can change variables and write this as a U integral. Sorry, this should be U zero here, very annoying. Um, I can write this as a U integral by changing variables, and there's the, uh, there's the F, F of zeros, just a Jacobian for doing that. Okay, this might be a good point to ask if there are any questions. I've, I've, I've gone rather quickly and said a lot of things. Everyone's fine? Okay. Formula for rho zero comes from a WKB approximation. Oh, sorry, I didn't, hear the, I didn't hear the first part. Uh, oh, I think you're... I'm just trying to remember what your formula for rho zero is. It comes from a WKB approximation. Oh. Yeah, it, it, sure. In, in the language, I guess, uh, I, 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 uh, in, in, in those pictures, yes, you can, you can think of it uh, uh, precisely in, well, it's, it's, actually, it's, 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 it's actually just sort of what, what you would, certainly you would do if, you, if that were just the classical potential, that, that's what you would do uh, at some energy. Um, uh, that, that's the thing you would write down. What we're going to see, uh, of course, uh, and I, I think this is this is where you're uh, where you, where you're going, and we will indeed see this when we do the full quantum mechanical problem. We'll we'll uh, we'll have wave functions that penetrate into the forbidden region, and so we ought to certainly pick up uh, uh, contributions uh, beyond just where that uh, where that vanishes, and we'll see all of that come in a moment. So yes, the, the language you're you're, you're alluding to there is, of course, uh, exactly right. Okay, so... Um, I have another question. So, ah. X started its life as being an index, I think, of the... Yes. But, but now it looks more like a, the eigenvalue, you said, or, or did I get confused? No, no, no. X is, um, X is, X is still the index, but I've gone to large n, so it, it's sort of a... Con it's taking continuous values on... Okay, yeah, that I understand. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> but then... Uh -huh. What what was yeah. the eigenvalue? Maybe I got confused, but uh, did you oh, okay. the eigenvalues or you didn't? Uh, the eigenvalues are there. They're the they're the e's. The remnant of them are the e's, the capital e's, um, uh, without hats on now. So let's go back to around here. Um, so I think it's all here. Um, so capital X, capital X began life as um, oh, okay. as little n over capital N. Okay, yes, 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 yes. So th thank uh -huh. you, I, I, it's clear now. Okay, good, right, and that, good. Yeah, it's a lot of... Sorry, yeah, it's clear. A lot, a lot of things and, and sort of different decades playing a role, so yeah, it's a lot to keep track of, uh, which is why I thought I would try and do this reasonably carefully. 
Uh, for those of you who like to think in other ways uh, about this, uh, um, you can you can also think of this in terms of uh, uh, this branch cut. Well, maybe we, we won't need this, but th there's ways of connecting to other ways of describing uh, the same the same thing. Let's say a little bit more. Um, matrix, if you if you go back to the original matrix model and write them now as identities for the PNs, um, they end up rec uh, giving you equations for the AN which you need. They're actually recursion relations for the AN, but then by time I go to the continuum, those become differential equations um, for the AX. A is a function of X now, and then once I take the double scaling limit and, and, and sort of cream off the, uh, the, good, the good stuff. Uh, remember the scaling piece of uh, A uh, is, 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 uh, is, is that U of X. So these become differential equations uh, for the UX and those are the string equations. So that's their origin. And the most famous example of this, of course, is the, is the panel of A1 equation, which showed up in, the, in, the, uh, in 1990. Uh, here I have, it's, it's some differential equation for U, um, which looks like this. And uh, for example, if I, if I look at the leading piece, so this will give me the option to tell you what leading piece means, what U, me U zero means, which is the solution of the equation if I send H bar to zero. If I send H bar to zero, I just get rid of that term. And so I solve and I have minus X to the half. That's an example of one of the k equals two minimal model we were talking about. And then, but then I can solve uh, recursively around that and, and develop a whole perturbation theory, which looks like that. And uh, there's, there's a, a long story about the non-perturbative physics that this doesn't capture, which I won't go into right now. Okay. The key thing then is that the P's uh, yield a nice, a nice Hilbert space for a, for a full quantum mechanics. By the time I've gone to the large end limit and, and done all of this, uh, if I actually look at the scaling, oh, well, that's not going to work, is it? If I look at the scaling, um, uh, if I double scale the object that tells me about the energy E itself inserted into this, or if you like position in eigenvalue space in the matrix model, this actually ends up becoming uh, this, this Hamiltonian with this potential uh, U. You can see the U part already showing up because that is that is indeed telling me about the endpoint and uh, a little bit more work tells you that there's some corrections uh, that, uh, that, uh, that business of writing one over N, there's one of N corrections, which became, uh, uh, which became H bar uh, ultimately. Um, those one over N corrections then I have, remember I have A of X. So I have A of X uh, plus some epsilon. Uh, that epsilon then will be generated by derivatives of A with respect to, uh, with respect to, um, with, with respect to X. And uh, indeed those derivatives will conspire to turn into that part of the Hamiltonian. So again, uh, you can look at the details in Gross and McDowell um, and also in a paper by Banks et al, which I'll talk about just in a moment. So that's where all those pieces come. So again, to re-emphasize and to look at the time, yeah, to re-emphasize, I have this Hamiltonian then, which arises from the matrix model. It isn't sort of some piece of magic, it's, it's there. Um, uh, it looks like this. And uh, if I solve the spectral problem for that, it amounts to uh, constructing uh, uh, and constructing this object, it amounts to uh, solving for the spectral problem of interest. I'll, I'll say a bit more about this formula in a moment. Okay, and if you take the classical limit of, of this, it, uh, it boils down to the formula I just uh, wrote down and derived for you that other way. Uh, with some appropriate normalization for the size that I'll talk about as well. Okay, so that's the piece of technology that I need and hopefully everything is in place. There's another piece of technology, very important, because this now will make contact with the JT gravity that we're interested in. So Banks, Douglas, Seiberg, and Schenker, again, 1989, uh, so many amazing papers came out in that, uh, in that, in that fall, 1989, 
Um, and uh, you, can, you, you can actually go back, look at, for example, the triangulation we were just talking about, or quadrilation or whatever, whatever uh, tessellation you did, um, the details don't matter. That's all non-universal physics. Once you take the double scaling limit, it all gives you the same physics. Um, you can hold a boundary of some fixed length, which they called L, but I'm going to call beta for reasons you'll see in a moment. And take the double scaling limit of that a whole story and ask what that is. And it will turn out to be this object that you compute. Um, so I need to unpack this a little bit. Uh, I take e to the uh, minus beta of h, our Hamiltonian h that we're interested in, and I form the trace of it in this following way. It's a trace, but there's something inserted. I'm projecting something out. I'm only doing the integral from minus infinity up to mu. And uh, so um, uh, one way of thinking about um, what that trace looks like, being a little bit more explicit, is, is to do the following. I can insert a complete set of states, right? Uh, the psi, psi ket, psi bra, like that. And then uh, go, uh, uh, and then actually operate with H, take out E to the minus B to E. I have something like this. And then you can see, let me remove that. You can see that then this is then the expression we had previously in terms of a Laplace transform of some density rho. And then the density row is, as promised, exactly of that form. OK, so this projector is a nice way of writing uh, this uh, when we have other things we might want to compute. Uh, and I'll use it in a moment. But uh, hopefully you can see that this is just what we want for JT. This, and indeed, um, Schenker, Saad, um, uh, so Schenker, uh, 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 Saad and uh, um, Stanford um, uh, already noticed that this reminded them uh, of of uh, of this macroscopic loop formalism from the old matrix models. And and uh, if we can get the right potential for H, then it will be the uh, uh, a way of defining the JT gravity partition function. So I'm going to write this equation here, and for a suitable choice of U. Uh, this will be what we need, where instead of loop length, we have beta. Okay, you can compute higher orders, uh, higher order correlations of, of Z. Uh, Banks et al. showed how this works, and this, it's a beautiful formalism. Uh, you can write it all in terms of, um, of, uh, of a free fermion uh, description. The orthogonal polynomials, because, because of the presence of that determinant in the matrix model, the, the van der Mond determinant, uh, you can write that all as, in terms of Slater determinants, and then there's a natural free fermion language, which we won't need here. But um, that, that's how they think about it, and it's a very efficient way of deriving higher formulae. And indeed, uh, the connected piece for Z and Z uh, looks something like this. You can actually expand that a little bit. We'll, 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 we'll need this result later. Um, you can expand this a little bit, and it looks something like this. So I essentially just have uh, something a little bit more complicated than just the simple Laplace transform with some more general object here, which I can construct. If I knew these wave functions and all the energies, I could compute this completely. And that's where we're going. Let me give you an example, um, just to help with your intuition about how this works. Let me uh, stay with the toy model. Let me talk about the toy model, the airy model, because it's, a, it's, a, it's an important um, prototype, if you like, it's the very endpoint of the uh, of, of JT gravity in the in the triple S description. Um, the potential is just u equals minus x, and uh, if I just write down the the uh, spectral problem, it's basically the defining equation of the airy function after some change of variables, and I write this like that. Um, I've chosen a normalization here. I'll explain that normalization in a moment. So there's the potential. I have basically a bunch of airy functions that look like this. They come in, they're oscillatory far out, and then they, uh, they hit at some energy, and there's the exponential tail. And uh, let me just look at the leading order for a moment. The leading order piece, uh, an airy function behaves like this, um, uh, leading order, and then there's the oscillatory pieces. And so I could actually just put that into my expression 
for uh, for rho. Um, let me just uh, work with mu equals um, uh, zero here. The problem is translation invariant, so it's not important. And uh, you'll get some e to the half uh, over pi h bar. And in fact, I've normalized. That told me what this particular normalization of the wave functions needed to be in order to reproduce the disk uh, partition function. So there's another way of thinking about what that k equals one model is. Going back to our other way of thinking about it, I could just ask what potential do I put into this to get the leading order, to get the leading order behavior and with the normalization I have here, if I stick u equals minus x, so I need to know what f is, I just take a derivative of this, it's just one, I put that in there um, and uh, do that integral and I get that as the result. So of course, there's a whole family of cases if I put u equals minus x to some one over k and stick that in there just on general grounds, you can see it's gonna give me some e to the k minus a half. And the minimal models from the Hermitian matrix model in general are, uh, uh, does just the right thing. The, the, the string equation in general is a lot more complicated uh, than just uh, powers of x. Um, uh, it looks like this. There's some polynomial in U and all of its derivatives. It's nonlinear. Um, each case model, imagine just picking K equals two or something and set all the others to zero. Each case model has um, a function like this. The K equals two version would give you this, for example, which is the example I gave before, panel of A1 equation. And it turns out that you can couple together in a, in a sense that will be useful to us. You can derive um, if you like, a model that flows between all the different minimal models by simply coupling them linearly in this, in this, uh, in this expression in a way that's deceptively simple because of course the U you solve is, uh, you solve a much more complicated equation when you have m many of these uh, 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 coupled together. But at the level of the matrix model and the double scale matrix model, it uh, has that simple form. And that's uh, rather nice. So these, these things are often called the couplings, but you can think of them as coefficients of operators that you're turning on in some, in some, uh, in some minimal model. At leading order then, I drop H bar, uh, I, I drop all terms with an H bar, I just have the polynomial piece U to the K. And so at leading order, the string equation looks like this. Okay, let me just say a little bit about non-perturbative physics. I need to hurry up and going a little, uh, perhaps too slowly. Um, a little bit about non-perturbative physics. Well, the area model is simple enough. I can just solve the whole model. Um, I know the partition, uh, I know the wave function. I can just stick that in there and actually solve it. And actually just uh, area function identities tells me what that looks like. And uh, there's the leading e to the half. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of, uh, um, oscillatory pieces and possibly uh, instanton pieces as well. I, I have a little warning down here, danger. I won't have time to uh, unpack that completely. So let me not talk about the danger just for a moment. Uh, let me just first talk about the fact. So there's this, let me plot it. There's the e to the half that we talked about before. And then that function that I just derived for you, that full, that full, um, function here is the full non-perturbative corrections to the airy model, the simple toy model, and uh, it's all rather nice. Now the danger I referred to is the fact that there are negative energy um, uh, contributions that appear um, uh, due to instanton effects that take you into E less than zero, what's called the forbidden zone in, uh, in uh, Sard, Schenker and Stanford. And uh, I'll come back to that shortly, but um, that the intuition about that in this language is really easy uh, to understand. And so I, again, I find this useful very, picture very useful. At high enough energies, I have positive energies. There's the uh, airy type function, but even though I'm only integrating from minus infinity up to zero in this case, there are still tails 
of airy functions at lower energies that will penetrate into that region. And that's precisely what's the origin of this kind of stuff. So if you're interested, th this potentially uh, endangers the stability, the non-perturbative stability of these models. And so you see the intuition about why, uh, how you might solve the non-perturbative instability comes down to being more careful about this stuff. And I'll show you how to do that shortly. So I'm going to skip a whole bunch of uh, uh, um, thoughts about um, uh, about about some of that and and jump towards supergravity because I realize that I uh, only have um, about eight minutes left. <clears throat> so supergravity. Let's talk a little bit about that. So. I showed you how to get those fractional positive powers of E, but I didn't tell you what this is doing. What, what, how do I get uh, this one over root E um, type behavior? And that will connect to what I just talked about uh, in, in a moment. So it's actually easy to see uh, where that comes from. Let's look at our, let's look at our row, uh, our uh, disk level row and look at this and ask, well, what happens if I have um, U equals zero in that formula? And you can see that it'll just spit out that one over root E behavior for me for some value of mu. And now in our normalization, it tells me that um, uh, I should be using mu equals one. And so I will use that henceforth, but mu can be uh, other values. And I'll tell you what that um, might mean. We can talk about what that means uh, later on. So it turns out that there are matrix models that produce this kind of behavior, and they're called complex matrix models, although you can get them in other kinds of matrix models as well, but complex matrix models are the first place um, you might look because it's quite natural. Instead, uh, and this goes back to work that um, uh, Tim Morris did back in uh, uh, 1990, uh, you can start with complex matrices instead and do pretty much everything that we did before um, with the double scaling story. Um, but now I write some potential in terms of uh, um, complex matrices, uh, M, uh, M and its complex conjugate multiplied together like that. There's a nice invariance uh, by multiplying by unitaries again, um, two different unitaries, one on each side. There's an N by N matrix. And I can quickly, uh, uh, I don't have to go through the details again because it looks very much like the Hermitian matrix model case, except that instead of lambda, um, I, I essentially have lambda squared. Essentially, I have eigenvalues lambda of, of this quantity, which naturally come together. They're naturally positive. And essentially, the van der Mond determinant looks like that, except it's in terms of lambda squared. The, uh, the measure is d lambda squared. I've just written it as lambda d lambda and thrown away the two. And you're, you're done. That's essentially it. It's that, but on the positive real line. You can do a little bit more, and it will be important uh, for us. I can actually add, uh, and in, in fact, um, uh, 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 myself and my co-authors back in the early 90s played with uh, additionally adding um, more terms, uh, sorry, a logarithmic term proportional to some quantity I'll call gamma. Uh, uh, Kostov also thought about this. So he was thinking about adding open string sectors and uh, uh, to Hermitian matrix models, and he was playing with terms like this. Or you can actually work with uh, rectangular matrices where it's n by n plus gamma and uh, Lafrance and Myers uh, um, showed quite nicely that all of these things are equivalent and what happens is that it introduces an extra piece here um, a two gamma uh, to the uh, to the effective uh, measure and so uh, in modern language however this is what we would call in the uh, uh, outland zone bar um, notation for generalized matrix ensembles. This would be an alpha beta equals one plus two gamma comma two uh, ensemble. And I'll make contact with that because that was one of the ensembles that Stanford and Witten studied in their JT descriptions. Now you can actually uh, do the double scaling and the string equation ends up looking like this. It's a lot more complicated. And so this goes back to some of my thesis work I'm feeling very old these days. Um, this is th th 30 years ago. And uh, the generalization to include gamma was done in um, uh, 1993. And the equation looks like this. Let me help you uh, with this equation. So the quantity I wrote before, which is the Hermitian matrix model string equation, um, is essentially this quantity, capital R, capital curly R, capital curly R um, equals zero would be the Hermitian matrix model equation. But this equation 
is much larger than that, it's part of this. You can see that r equals zero is a solution if I turn gamma equals zero, I turn gamma off, but we want something much more interesting than that. Have a look at this. Uh, if I uh, work at the disk level, which means set h bar equals zero everywhere, I'll have just this term will go away as will that one and that one, and I'll just have this. U will be now u zero times r squared equals zero. And I have two kinds of solution. I have the one I talked about before, which would be the uh, familiar sort of emission matrix model type solutions, but I also have u equals zero. Now, the key to understanding this is to put these two things together as x varies in the following way. So for positive x, I have u equals zero. For negative x, I have this kind of behavior, the stuff that we saw from the uh, previous kind of minimal models. Now, one of the things that I was doing 30 years ago was solving, showing that such solutions actually exist, and indeed I did, and they look like this. And uh, uh, this, this was the papers by, um, by, uh, by um, so Daly, Johnson, and Morris, there's a series of papers where we, 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 we showed the existence of those solutions and argued for their uniqueness and things like that. I didn't have time to go into it. But what happens is that this thing smooths out and develops a little well and then goes off to zero. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of things to be said here and time is short, so I'm gonna try and say them, but uh, rather quickly. Um, so we notice- uh, Why don't you give yourself a few other extra minutes instead of rushing too much? Oh, okay, I, I, um, uh, thank you. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, uh, it was clear even back then, although of course the D-brain language wasn't um, around much then uh, that uh, uh, gamma is something to do with open strings um, for reasons uh, that I don't have to go into, but you could see it quite naturally, just uh, it was counting open string sectors. Now you would say that counts the number of D brains. And, uh, but we still didn't quite understand what those models were. We, we actually thought um, that they were, they were, they were still bosonic. Um, uh, uh, gravity uh, store, uh, uh, part of a bosonic gravity story. So if you do read those papers, beware of that the, the, the equations are correct, but some of the words, you know, we're still reaching for what uh, it was meaning. Um, Klebanoff, Malderson, and Seiberg in 2003, when minimal strings were, 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 were sort of revisited by the field, actually, um, actually did a, a careful analysis and showed that this was part of a story involving type zero projections. And these turned out to be the type zero A superconformal backgrounds. Um, so those are the, what these minimal strings are. Uh, in that picture, indeed, gamma counts the number of D brains, but then they also realized that the mysterious, there was a mysterious region that we could see looked like a world sheet expansion, but we didn't understand. Those actually count number of units of Ramon Ramon flux. And there's a beautiful duality um, in some cases between these and a type zero B picture that involves a different kind of matrix model. And it's all very beautiful and I don't have time to tell you about it, but it's not relevant for what we need here. It's enough to know that it's a distinct class of minimal string models that are going to be interesting. And so here's the interesting thing. And this is what made me realize the connection with, uh, with the recent work. We'd noticed back in 1993 that something very interesting happens um, at weird values of gamma. Um, for example, if you expand it around zero, if you just uh, look at the expansion here, you'll see u is zero as it is, plus um, some, some corrections, but all of those corrections have a factor of gamma squared minus a quarter in front of them. And that was sort of really curious and some interesting things happen. In fact, I generalized all of that for, um, for, for, for gamma equals half inch, integer more generally, you, you get, um, you get uh, uh, interesting things. So gamma equals half, the entire thing truncates. Uh, go, all of the perturbative stuff goes away. For um, higher values of gamma, um, depending upon what K is in the Kth minimal model, you'll find that, again, there's a vanishing beyond a certain level of perturbation theory. Um, there's also a very interesting family of rational solutions, which I think is very interesting, but um, you can, there's some papers I wrote in, in 2004, which explored some of that. But again, gamma half integer didn't seem to be physically natural. But I was proposing even back then that maybe it's good for something physical, but I didn't know what. Okay, now let's go to uh, uh, today. 
this u equals zero sector uh, over here is precisely what we want for that one over root e type behavior in the disk spectral density. This is what we need. You can't get that uh, without, you, you can, but you need to, to put in some what might seem artificial things in Hermitian matrix models in order to get that. So it's very natural in this complex matrix model um, language. The vanishing then at gamma equals plus or minus a half just kept ringing bells for me when I saw the uh, Stanford Witten paper um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, July of last year. And I began to wonder if there was a connection. And indeed there is a connection, I'll show you what it is. But the conjecture would be that indeed half integer gamma is indeed telling you about non-orientable services. And it's telling you about, for example, the uh, uh, two of the models that uh, Stanford and Witten were studying. But before I go on to that, let me just to be clear, let me contrast the two types of minimal model. So I, let me define this quantity R U plus X, which is that simplest K equals one type case. The Hermitian matrix model just say that vanishes. So that's the U equals minus X, the airy potential. The complex matrix model would say, actually I need to solve this larger equation where I, have, where I have it going to zero on the right hand side. I, just for simplicity, I've set gamma equals zero here, but you can do this for other gamma as well. So you're solving this more complicated equation. Well, uh, you know, you can solve it. It's highly nonlinear, and, uh, um, but you, know, you, can, you can put it on a computer and you can solve it. In fact, the K equals one uh, case actually um, maps to uh, uh, the properties of a, solu a known solution of panel of A2 for which many things have been proven. So that solution, you don't even need to do numerics for that case. And so they look like this. And now you can see exactly what I was saying before, which is that um, I have, uh, actually, if I go a little bit further, you can see some really nice features. The airy model, basically, it was airy everywhere at any energy. At high energies, this indeed is airy. As I go to lower and lower energies, though, it, it's, the potential stops being this just minus x and becomes something else. And in fact, uh, you can write the partition uh, keep saying partition, you can write the wave function in terms of Bessel functions uh, in, this, uh, in this regime. And in between there's some sort of hybrid airy Bessel type behavior. You can actually solve, um, oh, uh, before I do that, this is what the sphere ah, disk level stuff looks like. There's the root E for airy, there's the root E for this case, but then there's a one over root E as well. And in fact, you can solve this explicitly, as I as as I did, um, uh, you need numerics to do it, but uh, you you can you can solve uh, the spectral problem, and it looks like this. So this is again just k equals one, but this is the kind of thing we're going to need to do for the full um, story. So uh, oh, the key thing I wanted to tell you about there, ah, where did it go? The key thing I wanted to tell you about there as well, which I won't have time to go into in more detail, but I can in questions is that you can see why these are, uh, uh, these are the hints of why this is a much nicer non-perturbative problem. There's no forbidden zone penetration here. The model naturally stops at equal zero um, because of uh, what happens to this potential. You can think of it in a way these super cases as regularizing these unsuper cases by chopping off that potential and making it end in a different way. So some of that intuition uh, is what led to that first paper I wrote in December about that um, case. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients. I have the E, the positive uh, E uh, half integer behavior, and I have this behavior, and I now need to put them together. So the recipe would be as follows. I have the tree level string equation is our guide. Um, uh, I can form that function I need to go into that integral called f. I just take a derivative, looks like that. Um, and then I, all I need to do is determine the, connect, the correct f, which gives me the desired row. And that essentially amounts to determining what the right t's are. And that would be the recipe for putting together the uh, minimal models. Um, we'll need an infinite number of them though, as you'll see. So we could do this. Uh, and here are the steps. Uh, if I expand, this is the expansion I wrote before, I have some coefficient CK, um, and 
I ask that it look like this with the f coming from the string equation with unknown coefficients t and the t turn out to be this in, in, in my normalization. Uh, this actually was first done uh, because they were doing an interesting perturbator story uh, by Okoyama and uh, Sakai in this paper. You can actually invert this, um, so you can actually integrate the result and, and, and get a nice uh, result for what the tree level equation looks like, and that's in my paper here. But my focus is going to be the super case, um, henceforth, you have cosh root E over root E, it looks like this, with a different family of those, and you can do the same prescription, and you get this rather nice formula for the T. So that's kind of nice. Uh, you can invert that and get this beautiful, um, uh, quite simple equation for uh, what uh, the leading potential looks like. And uh, so in summary then, the non-perturbative definition would be the following. There's my JT partition function for some appropriate choice of U. Um, uh, I can define it. I need to solve the nonlinear ODE, the string equation to get uh, the, and then solve the spectral problem. And for the JT supergravity series, uh, the proposal is that this is the equation you should solve. I'll skip uh, talking about the, the non-perturbative aspects of this for um, ordinary uh, uh, JT in view of the time uh, and, and move straight on now. So the observations are as follows. Um, well, the best understood cases in Cyborg, ah, sorry, Stanford and Witten um, uh, where gamma equals plus or minus a half and gamma equals zero, which were these cases in their notation, the alpha, beta, outland, uh, zone bar notation. Um, and puzzling things happen. Uh, uh, th th there's, there's, problems with, uh, there's problems with the recursion relations telling you that perturbatively uh, uh, cases beyond that uh, don't seem to uh, make sense, at least perturbatively. Uh, by the way, uh, these two models are time reversal invariant, but there's also a, a time non-time reversal invariant uh, case as well. These cases have um, non-orientable uh, sectors as a result, and indeed, then gamma equals half corresponds to, or plus or minus a half corresponds to having non-orientable sectors, as I had guessed. But this, I'm saying, defines these models non-perturbatively. And in fact, given that I can find solutions of the string equation for other values of gamma um, besides those cases, it suggests that there's a non-perturbative definition um, that goes beyond those cases. There's a concern, though, however. This all might seem rather formal because U solves an infinite order differential equation. Okay, so, uh, you know, this might just be, uh, this might be nice and saying, well, in principle, I can define this non-perturbatively and that's, that's cool, but can I actually get results? And what I'm here to tell you is that this isn't just formal. Uh, we can solve it. So let me end now by showing you some practical results. And the practical results comes from the fact that there's a very nice truncation scheme. And this is what's in my most recent paper. So I have these TKs. And if I look in the string, I have some horrible nonlinear differential equation, for example, um, these, uh, for, this is for all k, k going from 1 to infinity, uh, multiplying, for example, derivatives, 2 k order derivatives. So this really is a horrible um, uh, high order, infinite order differential equation. But notice a couple of things. If I just look at this formula, you can see that actually after a while, those TKs become less and less important as I go to higher and higher k. And you can already see this organizes itself rather nicely at uh, the disk level. Let's take this nice equation and I can just expand, uh, I can just expand it and there's the, uh, there's the uh, different t's uh, um, bringing in higher and higher powers of u. <clears throat> and if I go to this picture, uh, you can see what's going on quite nicely. This black solid line is the function at the bottom there, the full disk level um, function poten uh, potential. Uh, in principle, I can, uh, well, what I've done is I've, I've inverted it numerically so that I can plot it for you. And, uh, but I can go ahead and I can actually look at different truncations. And for example, truncation one is just, if I just kept the first two Ts, I get some approximation to it, which then eventually deviates at some, at some energy scale. But I can add more. Uh, the uh, the other the other case here, where I keep four of them, actually, 
hugs the line for a while um, before it begins to deviate. And so I could reliably work uh, to some approximation uh, below some energy scale around there and get good, uh, good behavior and so on and so forth. So you can actually truncate what I actually do is I solve, for example, it's still right, relatively high order, but it's actually not uh, too difficult, it turns out, um, to solve high order. And in fact, with care, you can go to up to 12th or even in some cases, 15th and 16th order as I did for some examples. So I truncate to T6. It's enough to get me, look, look at this. Uh, this is the actual full nonlinear solution now of the equation. There's a little well and it goes up. The dotted line is the tree level um, uh, function given that by that Bessel function. And you see they agree for a while. If I were to go much further up, they would disagree. But by the time I get to those energies, the actual um, non-perturbative corrections aren't so different from the classical corrections. So this just joins on to the classical potential. Um, uh, later on. All the action happens, all the changing that happens is in this interior regime. So you can reliably do this truncation scheme. Now time is short, so I'm simply going to give you some results. I can then solve for the spectrum of H. Again, I need to do that numerically, but I, you can do that and I can construct this as, the, as, uh, as, as instructed. And here are the results. So there is the JT supergravity spectral density, the dotted line is the, is, the, uh, is the cosh root E over root E. There's the 2-2 case, quite spectacularly, and there are avatars of this uh, in uh, some special toy models in, in um, SW. Um, quite spectacularly, the non-perturbative corrections um, kill that root E type behavior uh, to zero, and then you get these lovely wiggles, which eventually merge into the classical result at large energy. This is the fully non-perturbative physics. Every single one of these points is computed by the methods I mentioned. I know the wave function uh, precisely uh, normalized and the energy at every, for every one of those. And so I have that bag of wave functions I can compute things with now. Oh, there's the zero two case, for example, which enhances that. Um, sorry, that, going uh, back to, sorry, Cliff, uh -huh. yeah. going back to oh, the previous sure. uh, plot. Uh-huh. Yes. What happens when you are not, I mean, um, you did that, this for a very large H power. I'm, I'm just worried on oh. how you approach the classical limit. I mean, in some limit, I would have expected that you would uh, reproduce the one over square root of E. Yes, uh, and, and you do. Uh, can I show you that in a moment? I'll show you exactly sure, yeah, how that yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is essentially, thank you for reminding me to say that. This is essentially for H bar equals one. So if you like, I've turned up the strength okay, yeah. of the non perturbative effects as much as possible. Um, but actually, I, I, you, can, you can actually dial H bar down. The equations come a bit harder to solve, but in principle, you can do the whole analysis again and change H bar. Um, and, uh, and what happens, uh, let's see if I can do it on here. What happens is that you'll see more and more of this looks classical. And then, um, oh, this is not a good example. Uh, okay. You'll, 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 you'll see features down here that eventually are trying to reconstruct, as, as you might anticipate, trying to reconstruct that, uh, that peak. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you, can, you can follow. It's actually rather nice to see how it all works. I've, I've done a lot of numerical experiments with this um, uh, to show that it all fits together. There's the zero two case. And uh, so, uh, and I, I don't have time to tell you, this is a little bit like what I was talking about now, um, but, uh, in view of the time, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this. But you can kind of see these these bumps are trying to reconstruct uh, the the peaks uh, that uh, the the model knows knows is there. Okay. You can also compute the spectral form factor. Uh, I think I'm running horribly over time now, so I won't say too much about this. I've already warmed you up for what that means. Uh, but I, I can compute the disconnected piece using the prescription I just, just gave, and there's this green function here, and I can compute this. And now you can see, oh, look, I not only have the beginning of the ramp behavior, but the, comp the whole computation includes the turnover into the plateau as well. So you can put those together, and there's the famous saxophone shape of your um, uh, spectral 
form factor, uh, showing all of the uh, parts that diagnose the quantum chaos in the dual system in this averaging way. Okay, some new results. The one, two supergravity, you might not like time reversal invariant uh, uh, gravity. So uh, here's one that doesn't have that. That simply corresponds to putting gamma equals zero in this formalism. It looks a little bit like this. There's a very interesting feature here, which is that there's some finite uh, rho at equal zero, which I'd like to understand a little bit more from other perspectives, but that's the result and you can compute that. I, I generated this for you last night as a treat for showing up, so thank you. And uh, let me quickly summarize uh, with apologies for going over, but hopefully it was worth it. Um, so various JT gravities can be constructed out of minimal string theories of various types. A natural question is uh, how, to what extent can one do this um, further? Uh, what, what aspects of this generalizes to other kinds of minimal string theories and so on and so forth? I suspect there's a lot to be done. I think you can do a lot more. And I think the very existence of various other kinds of minimal string theories put together the right way defines, um, uh, in some cases, non-perturbatively, um, other kinds of JT gravity. And I, I think they're all captured perturbatively in that lovely paper of um, uh, Stanford and Witten. And uh, you just have to find the right minimal strings. I should say that there's been a lot of work in this area trying to understand how to use either Louisville theory or minimal strings in various ways to understand aspects of JT gravity. Uh, I mentioned Okoyama and Sakai, but there's some other authors such as uh, Betsy Olsen, Papadou Lukai, and um, uh, Papadoulaki, sorry, and Mertens Tiriachi and Maxfield Tiriachi. Uh, it's mostly perturbative. My focus has been non perturbative um, uh, here, and I, I, I think that's a, a sort of an exciting area. Um, it's not formal. We can do explicit way, I've shown you explicit way of extracting results. I also expect that deformations of JT gravity can be studied in this way, and it should amount to simply just changing the TK recipe. Um, uh, I started some work on that with the student, um, Felipe Rousseau, and we're excited about how some of that looks. Okay, so there's much more to do, but, uh, uh, and so hopefully I can report to you uh, later on. So thank you, and apologies again for running over. Is there a simple way to understand where the plateau comes from? The... Um, uh, yes, uh, let's see if I have, um, uh, well, it, from the point of view of the, these matrix models, um, this prescription, yes. Uh, let me see uh, how, yes, actually I have a slide. That slide where I quickly showed you, where am I? Okay, essentially, I'm, I'm not, this is maybe a technical answer, not a physical intuition answer. I'm not sure where are we. Yes. Uh, if you unpack, you go back to Banks et al. and unpack their prescription for constructing the two point function. And look what I've done here. Uh, if you expand this out um, with a couple of steps, which I haven't shown, like this is the connected piece, which is the part that will tell you about um, the uh, uh, plateau. If you expand this out, um, you'll see just looking at the piece that has uh, two of these and then just one P to the right, it'll look a P, it'll be a piece like this. Okay, uh, so um, this uh, then looks like the partition function as though I just have beta plus beta primed as my, as my, uh, as my loop length. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's manifestly positive. And that is actually the plateau. So for example, when I make beta, when I make beta into, uh, I make, this is beta plus IT, and this is beta minus IT. So this just becomes two beta. And that's the, actually the plateau. And then uh, I, I can subtract from that because of this bit. And that this subtraction happens at earlier times and that's what pulls it back down to become that. So that's that in this language is what that, uh, is, is how that works. So in some ways, the plateau is sort of manifestly um, straightforward in this language. I, I think some intuition in terms of spectra of matrices and things like that, uh, uh, it would be nice to have better words to connect those two, but technically you can see that all those elements are conspiring uh, uh, in the right way to, to make it work like this. I hope, I hope that sort of got at what you were asking. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Are there any other? Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. So, but is is there some intuition for so? You arrived at some very particular matrix model out of the whole zoology of matrix models, which had some finely tuned TKs that gave you the spectrum you wanted. So if we go back to the tessellated surfaces that are built out of that collection of TKs, is there some easy way to see that what you're building in the, is there any interpretation of the, of the collection of tessellated surfaces that you're building? I, 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 th th this, this in some ways goes back to discussions that we all had, in, in, including you, I think, uh, back in the uh, back in the early 90s, which is that the double scaling limit creams off a lot of universal stuff. And there's a lot of non-universal stuff that just doesn't matter. And that turns into being the, the details of the tessellation, whether I use triangles or squares or what have you. When, when Tim did his, uh, when Tim did his complex matrix model stuff, it looked really weird in that you could associate the uh, M uh, with with one kind of triangle and M complex with a different kind of triangle, and he called them checkered surfaces. So you had these black and white triangles that were that were tessellating the surface, and uh, again, none of that really matters, perhaps. Although the people I think made some. Uh, guesses as to maybe the different kinds of matrices might correspond to, for example, the bosonic fields and the fermionic fields and stuff like that. But I, I, I don't think the intuition is clear precisely because the double scaling limit really uh, pulls out, um, a, a, you know, a lot of the universal physics gets pulled out. Uh, it's not clear what the separation between universal and non-universal is before you take the double scaling limit. So I, I would say that the intuition isn't clear in terms of decorating surfaces, unless there's been advances that I don't know about. This is 30 years ago, mm -hmm. so maybe there are some awesome papers that have done more uh, more work on that, but I don't know what they are. Yeah, I, I didn't have so much in mind, you know, the microscopic tessellation, but more like um, the, um, you know, what what continuum fluctuating geometries you're building. So for instance, can you can you look at that collection of TKs and say, oh, obviously this is something that's asymptotically ADS2. Oh, I see, yes. Um, that's something I, I, I would like to understand better, for example, how, you know, how does the asymptotic ADS2 part uh, emerge? Uh, I, I don't have a good intuition about that. I think some of the papers that I mentioned at the very end, uh, um, I, I think are, are reaching towards um, by looking at some of the work that's been thinking about Louisville theory, I think has been, I don't think I have, I'm not sure I have all of those on here. Um, uh, those might have begun to put that story together. Uh, I, I do not, I do not know, but um, I don't have a good intuition at, at that level. There, there, I, there are other intuitions that this technology gives you knowing about the form of that, let me just write on right here because we have a bit of blank space. Knowing, uh, knowing the behavior of the, um, where are we? Knowing the behavior, you know, properties of this function U that comes out um, uh, and, and what is possible from various kinds of matrix models that I do have a good intuition about and that can be very useful, for example, understanding not, not just non-perturbative stuff, but also perturbative stuff. For example, the fact that you going to zero uh, is what you need for this kind of behavior in, in, in row and stuff like that. Th that you can get uh, from intuition about you, but that again is after the double scaling, which might not be what you're asking about. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Oh, hi, Cl uh, Clifford. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for a great talk. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question about correspondence with SYK models. So the the basic case is just the usual Majorana SYK. And then I guess the super case is like supersymmetric SYK. Mm -hmm. You see this peak at uh, zero energy and all that. Uh, so, in, so I'm a little puzzled about this uh, non-perturbative fact you see in the boson, uh, in the basic case where 
rho uh, rho is slightly not uh, is still not vanishing for e less than zero yes because, because uh, i thought there you just say this is just the density of state uh, states of the syk model and you shift by the ground state so by definition uh the all the states are sort of starting at uh, uh, at zero energy <laughs> so yeah think about this uh, small non-vanishing contribution at uh, I, this puzzle is not there for the super case which is very nice but uh, yes indeed the indeed it's one of the reasons i focus on the super case because it's less it's less puzzling um uh i uh so first of all let me let me so let me say that uh, Triple S, uh, Saad Schenker, Stanford already noticed that um, this was puzzling, this penetration into the, uh, into mm -hmm. the forbidden zone. Um, and, uh, sorry, I don't know how to erase. Okay, I'll, I'll just write there. Um, and uh, so, so they, Ignore the rest of the slide. I, it's not relevant for this. So, so they wondered whether it's it's simply telling you that these models are are, are non perturbatively ill defined, and and and, and uh, so that's sort of what it looks like. And um, this is the airy case. Now, before let me let me say two things. One is that um, this on its own, and actually I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this because you know this better than I do. This on its own is not uh, a sign of an instability. You actually have to look at the uh, effective potential for one eigenvalue and see whether or not, um, although there are these negative energy states, whether or not the eigenvalue is able to occupy them because there could be an effective potential that simply stops it from going to that regime. And in the odd K models, in fact, uh, those models seem non-perturbatively okay, precisely because the effective potential does turn up in that way. Um, for the even K models, um, uh, it turns down, and that corresponds to the tunneling instability that you know we all discussed a lot back in the uh, in the 90s, telling us that the bosonic models seem to be ill-defined. The bosonic K. Now, um, because S, because triple S's matrix model is essentially built by an infinite number of these k's, both even and odd, it would seem, as they suggested, that those models are indeed doomed in some non-perturbative sense. Um, uh, and so uh, my, my first paper on this stuff was an attempt to remove this region by essentially using the supersymmetric models combined in a bosonic way in order to lift this region. And so that gives you a definition that agrees at high energy, but then differs at low energy. I don't know if that's correct. It's a definition. Um, but if you look at my recent paper, I, I, I think there may be another possibility, which, which is that you, you think of triple S as a K odd model and, and, the, and the K even models are, are sort of turned on as backgrounds within that. And they're not turned on fully in a way that generates the full instability. They sort of turn on enough to generate the, the right spectral density. But uh, one, what we'll need to check then is that even though you have these tails in that model, gosh, this diagram has become horrible. Even though you have these tails, maybe in that full model, you can show that the effective potential, uh, again, uh, stops the, the, the non-perturbative tunneling instability. I haven't done that calculation, but I found some solutions of the right string equation that suggest that this might be possible. So it's a conjecture that actually the presence of the odd models mixed with the even models in the right way can stop the, the, the bad behavior of the even models from, from messing up the definition. I'm not sure. But I, either way, I think you're right. Non-perturbatively, this is dangerous. Um, and the issue is, can one find ways of cleaning that up or are those models just non-perturbatively ill-defined and we shouldn't just talk about that aspect or not? I, yeah, I, I was just puzzling know. what the interpretation of it is in this SYK model. Yeah. You, you just have some finite range of the spectrum, you shift it and... 
Uh, but yeah, there is yeah. something to think about. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have a good intuition on the SYK side, uh, precisely because it's talking about non productive sectors, which are hard to get to grips with. And, you know, as, as, as Schenker has pointed out, it's doubly non perturbative from the point of view of, uh, of that dual model. So it's even harder. It's doubly or exponentially worse to think about. <laughs> um, okay. Thank uh, you. Any other questions? Okay. So, so if I understand correctly for the ramp and uh, plateau behavior, you don't need to reproduce the full cinch, right? You could do this for the simplest uh, model. Uh, yes, actually, so there's some toy, yes. Uh, and I'm not the first to notice this. Uh, you can, in fact, in any of these toy models, these toy double scale matrix models, you, you can get curves that look like this. Uh, of course, they're just toy behavior models, but if you're, if you're trying to understand um, you know, so maybe some general features of how they do that. You could actually use the airy model. Uh, if you look in the appendix of my paper, I, I um, as a, as a test to make sure my numerical methods are working, uh, you can you can there's a, there's known formulae for all of this. Um, I give the references for um, for just the airy case, uh, and then I can pretend I don't know those uh, examples, and I can I can I can do the numerical problem and, uh, and uh, you know, with the truncation just to check that that works. And so I was using the airy case as a sort of test bed to make sure my methods were working. And indeed, there are curves just like this um, uh, that you can get from, from, uh, from, from the airy model. And uh, you, can, you can look at how the non-perturbative effects work uh, in relation to the, you know, the perturbative stuff just gives you the ramp going off that way and then the normative effects turn on. You can control the value of H bar in the ways we talked about and all of that uh, there. So I, it, it's, a, it's a really good test bed for uh, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, Cliff, I also have a, a short question Hi. about still the plateau. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, again, going back to the plateau, um, is that also a non-perturbative feature? Uh, should, should one still know that Full non perturbative expansion to get the plateau. Uh, uh, as far as I yeah, as far as I understand, uh, I, I I don't know how that would. Uh, uh, if you look at the form of the, uh, let me just again write on this randomly. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the form of of this kind of diagram, okay. So I want connected and 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 you know you start adding in all kinds of things. Uh, the the the. It, 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 it simply produces corrections to the, the to the formula that gives you this part, you know, the that that part uh, the, the, the the ramp. And, and, and um, yeah, and 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 uh, so so then the question. So you need to know the non-perturbative effects to certainly know how it turns over. And as far as I know, there's no good intuition from these diagrams um, uh, perturbatively. For for you know you know the saturation that gives you that part, so you need that you need to know that, and um, and indeed uh, a really nice another a really nice other reason for studying these JT supergravity models is that these particular cases this zero two and two two case as observed by Stanford and Witten they have no perturbative corrections beyond rho uh, zero. Uh, all of those corrections are zero. Okay, everything that I computed on that previous slide is is uh, is is non-perturbative. All 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 of this stuff it comes from the non-perturbative stuff, mm -hmm. and so it's a great test bed for for seeing, indeed, then that uh, that all of this stuff is generated purely by non-perturbative corrections. This transition into 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 here. A remark about what Juan said, um, the, uh, the H bar, the strength of H bar being quite high here uh, means that you lose the linear, you know, the ramp is often referred to as the linear behavior here, which I, I think is a misnomer uh, in the sense that a strong coupling, that linearity quickly turns off because the strong coupling effects turn it over into this uh, piece here. And so in general, at weak coupling at H bar, very, very small, and beta um, very very small, you'll get you you get this being a linear ramp. But in general, it's it's uh it's 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 not necessarily linear, but it's still clearly a ramp, as you can see. Uh, that's just a, a remark. 
So you don't, you can, if you start, you're probably looking ahead and looking at the slope, just, and you'll see that it's not one on this logarithmic plot. And that's because H bar is very big. So the strong coupling effect, the strong coupling and non-perturbative effects turn it over very quickly. Any other questions? Okay. Well, there are no more questions. Let's thank Clifford again. Thanks for listening and uh, hopefully uh, see some of you soon, at least either real or virtually. <laughs>